Good evening, everyone. My name is Brandon Neal, and while I wish I could be here with you in person, uh, raising a glass and toasting, I am glad that we have this opportunity to connect uh, even virtually during this uh, time, this unprecedented time. I am also very ecstatic about being here with you this evening because I actually get the opportunity to merge two great passions that I've had as long as I can remember in life. Uh, the first, and while I'm wearing no hat, I'm actually wearing two hats this evening, and I'm very proud to wear. Uh, the first is I'm a member of the Board of Trustees uh, for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library, and I know I'm speaking to the choir when I say this organization does outstanding work for all of our community, and we're very fortunate to have its leadership in our, in our city and our county as well as our state. Uh, the second hat, which you couldn't tell, you maybe could tell from my shirt, and while we're here this evening, I am a uh, graduate of the uh, championship class of 2005 of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so I'm very glad to merge these two uh, great passions in my life together. Uh, my wife also went to Carolina as well as my brother. So we're Tar Heels through and through. And I'll just say to the alumni out there, uh, go Heels. And if there's any silver lining uh, to the COVID-19 is that our basketball season just didn't count this year. Right. And there was no Final Four. So I think we can just kick that one, erase that one out of the uh, history books. Um, so I'll actually get to do what I'm what I'm here to do, which is to welcome you to tonight's final draft home edition. We've had three great weeks of continuing to connect readers and writers through these great events, and we hope everyone is really enjoying this as a fun break uh, from shelter in place and the monotony that comes with the day of Zooms, work Zooms, uh, working at home, um, Zoom happy hours, which tend to be redundant, as well as our usual uh, Netflix uh, episodes. Um, so thank you again for joining us. I'd also like to give a kudos to uh, Town Brewing. If we were in normal times, we would actually be having this event at Town Brewing. And so hopefully some of you are still enjoying some of their beverages as we as we speak today. Uh, but if not, just know that they're still there for you. Pick up a growl or grab a bite to eat. Uh, they're still around. And the, so along the same vein of supporting small businesses during this time, I'd also like to remind everyone that any books, any of the authors you see here, you can purchase their books uh, from Park Road Books or Main Street Books, which are still available even during this time. Uh, they'll ship directly to you. You can order online and they're still available for you. Also for tonight's book, it will soon be available via a digital copy uh, through the library's Hoopla access. So be sure to check that out as well. So without further ado, I'm very pleased and to have this opportunity tonight to welcome uh, Nick Graham and Cecilia Moore, the co-authors of UNC A to Z. Uh, this richly illustrated reference and guide contains more than 350 entries packed with fascinating facts, interesting stories, and little known histories of the people, places, and events that have shaped Carolina, the Carolina we know today. Unfortunately, I didn't make the cut, but I understand that there, I understand why, and there are many interesting stories and people nonetheless. So first I'll introduce Nick. So Nicholas, is the university archivist at UNC, uh, and Cecilia is the former university historian. So between the two of them, I'm sure you'll have access to abundance of wealth uh, this evening. And their new book was just released by uh, the UNC Press, I believe yesterday, but certainly this week. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Nicholas and Cecilia to kick us off. Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, we'll save room for you in the, the second edition. Um, yeah. We are um, thrilled to be with you tonight. Wish we could be there in Charlotte with you, but um, appreciate everyone who's taken the time to uh, spend time with us tonight or to, to watch this and to help and to talk a little bit about uh, Carolina history. Um, I want to introduce myself first. I'm the university archivist at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I've been in that position for about five years, but I've worked in Wilson Library on campus since 2003. And I will just mention quickly my previous job was uh, managing the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, which is a statewide digital library program. And one of the partners that I had the pleasure of working with was the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, helping to digitize some of the terrific local history collections there. So at the beginning of my um, library career, I, I worked as a reference librarian um, in Wilson Library. And I relied heavily on the, the trio of reference books produced by William S. Powell um, and had the pleasure of getting to, to know Bill Powell a little bit. Um, many of you will be familiar with the Dictionary of North Carolina Biography, his Gazetteer and the Encyclopedia of North Carolina. 
And so these were fantastic sources, um, but we were, you know, I was often frustrated that there wasn't something similar for UNC. So this is something that wanted to work on for a long time. And this is UNC A to Z was envisioned and is published very much as a reference book. It's something that you can quickly grab and look something up uh, facts or um, stories about UNC history, but it's also something that I think any alum, any parent, any student can open to any page and find something that'll be fun and interesting about the, the university. So it's 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 full of um, facts and stories and um, you know new and you know sometimes challenging interpretations of our of our campus history. Um, so this was, um, you know, again, inspired initially by some of the work I did as a reference librarian, but, you know, I quickly realized that um, in order to get this done um, at all and done right, um, need, we, you know, need to be a, a collaboration. So I had the, the great privilege, privilege of working with Cecilia over the past several years. Um, hi, thank you, Nick. I'm Cecilia Moore. As uh, Brandon mentioned, I'm the former university historian. I was at UNC Chapel Hill for about 25 years and um, only the most recent job as university historian. But like Nick, is it, I too, as I was learning UNC history and having to figure out things, I relied a lot on Powell's works mm -hmm. and on other references and gradually more digital references mm -hmm. as those came to be online um, to answer the many questions that came from both students and administrators, sometimes the very sa the same questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when Nick approached me with this idea that he had about some kind of reference for UNC like that, we talked about it and I was really intrigued by the idea. We knew we didn't want to do a big, long five volume encyclopedia or something like that. We wanted something that could be a quick reference, um, but would be authoritative and reliable. And that could then lead people to go look and, and learn more, more on their own. So. That's what we did. I he asked me if I would help do it, and I was like, "Yeah, we can do this." And and in the course of doing it, in developing the list of entries we knew we wanted to do, and in researching some of those subjects, we both learned lots of new things. Mm -hmm. So, as a way to you know talk a little bit about you know what's in the book and to give some samples, we've got a, a short selection of images um, that I believe we can load and um, you know talk about some of what's there and um, how that represents what's in the in the book. All right. Um, so here it is, UNC A to Z. You can buy it now from UNC Press, from local bookstores. Um, and I want to um, give a shout out to Kristen Selecki, who is the artist who did the cover illustrations and the illustrations throughout the book. It's a fantastic job and um, it looks great and it's a great compliment to the um, to the entries in the book. Nearly everything, not quite, but nearly everything that's in there draws from resources in Wilson Library. This is a photo of the library shortly after it opened in 1929. Um, so the, the large trees that are in front of it aren't there, the, the additions aren't there. But um, this is where I've worked since 2003, this is where the university archives are and the other fantastic special collections in Wilson Library. And so this is where, you know, we, we drew from so many different sources manuscripts, archives, old issues of the Daily Tar Heel, old student publications, um, nearly everything we needed was there and is there and is open and available, um, not in person right now, but there's tremendous online resources. So anything that you know piques your interest in university history from our book or from other things you find, you'll be able to find more um, to dig into in, in depth in Wilson Library. So one of the uh, things that you know in, inspired something like this was you know and my work as a reference librarian and answering questions about UNC history, but also being on campus and you know hearing stories repeated, um, including some of the what I would call historical fictions repeated re repeated by some of the campus tour guides. Um, so a lot of what we were doing is investigating old old legends and campus myths and and kind of illuminating those. Um, this is you know one example of those. Um, this is the many of you who are alums will be familiar of the story of the legend of Hinton James, the first student walking all the way from Wilmington to Chapel Hill to start classes in 1795. Um, so what we do as, as archivists and as historians is we, we challenge these, these myths. We say, that's a great, you know, that, so that's the story. How do we know what we know? 
And so, that, you know, our work involves going back to like, how do we know that he walked all the way to Chapel Hill? It turns out that we don't know that. Um, we don't know that he did. We don't know that he didn't. Um, but we can see that this is a, a legend that emerged in the, the 20th century. So in the entry on Hinton James dormitory, you'll find, um, you know, more discussion about Hinton James walking to Chapel Hill or not. We're not really sure. Um, this is a, a photograph from um, around 1900 in the basement of alumni building of an early class in electrical engineering. And, and it, we, we put it in here because one of my favorite entries that I worked on was the entry on campus utilities. Mm -hmm. And because when you think about a campus that's over 225 years old, everything had all of the electrical systems, water systems, mm -hmm. sewer systems, got built over time. And, and oftentimes I found myself trying to describe to today's students what it would have been like to be a student there in the 1800s when there was no running water in buildings and no electricity. And in the course of doing all of this research, I, I learned a whole lot about campus buildings, about the um, people who served the students at first who were enslaved people and, and later, um, janitors and and different um, technicians and stuff so this was um this was very interesting and it also served there was during the time we were writing this was a time when there was a whole lot of more focus on campus history and a lot of interest from students and other people because of issues around um the university removed the name of william l saunders from a building in 2015 because of his ties to the clan in during reconstruction mm -hmm. and also about the ongoing debates about the confederate monument popularly known as silent sam so much of the research we did as nick talked about trying to separate sort of the popular historical mm -hmm. stories from what really happened um, informed this book this is um, a picture of um, the Phillips Hall Annex, and this is the first computer at the university. It filled an entire building. It was a UNIVAC computer installed in the late 1950s, very cutting edge at the time. And so this is kind of, you know, along the line of, of what Cecilia is talking about, an example of showing how the university has changed over time, but also highlighting research. So, you know, this is not, there's a lot about building names in here and, and traditions, but, you know, whenever possible, we try to show ways where the, the university has led or, um, you know, advanced research. Um, and so this was, you know, this was a, it was a cutting edge computer at the time. There are only a few in the nation, um, but it's also, you know, kind of astounding to picture a machine like that, which I would guess probably had less computing power than, than our, you know, cell phones today, but, um, you know, filling an entire building. I'll let you talk about this. Yeah, well, um, this, is one of my, this is Venable Hall in the 1950s, which if you're alums um, from more than a few years ago, you remember as the chemistry building. Um, this was a large, nearly all male chemistry class. Um, and I don't know how well you can see, you can see a very small professor um, in, in perspective underneath a wall-to-wall -wall blackboard and a giant periodic table. Um, and this was, you know, when we did this for the book, um, the idea of these like huge survey classes and, you know, the very much analog um, tools for teaching were, were one thing. Um, but now, you know, in the middle of our, our pandemic, um, I think the university is, is already rethinking these huge in-person classes. So this, this, this image um, as an example of the university's past becomes an even more striking, striking one. Um, one of the things that we um, we had to, we decided to do early on when we did the book is that we wouldn't do entries on individual people because it would just be too big and too unwieldy and too complicated. So we we talked about certain people who were well known Carolina people through building names and other and other entries, but. There was one person with a Charlotte pie, actually, who we knew we wanted to have his picture in the book. And this is the shot. So I'll let Nick tell the story. Um, this is a, a shot by Hugh Morton, um, the well-known photographer um, who also had Charlotte connections. Um, this was during a game against the University of Virginia. Um, I'm sure that many of you are watching the, the documentary on ESPN airing now about Jordan. Um, so this, you know, we, we talked briefly about what 
image we should select to illustrate the um, the entry in basketball, and then we both kind of looked at each other and like we don't need to think at all. We need to get we need to get Jordan in there. So this is a, a full page image in there. It's a great action shot by Morton, who was sitting sitting courtside. One of the things that um, you know we worked on once you know we were nearly done with the book and getting ready to publish it was the UNC Press um, because this was a you know timely and, and changing reference book wanted to have an online component so the press um, and and us worked with the Digital Innovation Lab which is a digital humanities program on campus um, based in the, the Department of um, in the College of Arts and Sciences so this website is live now it's unc a to z dot com. Um, it doesn't, it's not a replacement for the print book, but it's a way to, if you need to quickly look something up, um, you want to see who your dorm was named after, or you want to settle an argument, um, um, this is the place to go. And I don't think we did it at the beginning, but I, I do want to say that we both want to thank the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library folks for hosting this tonight. And um, UNC Press for all of the work they've done to help us get the book done. I think we've left enough time for questions if there, if there are any coming in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, Cecilia. Thank you again for being here with here, here with us today and sharing uh, just a brief, uh, brief overview of your book. Uh, we do have some questions coming in, and they're very interesting questions, some that I actually wanted to ask myself. So the first is from Ashley, and she asks, what is the most interesting tidbit you uncovered in your research? Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll go back to the utilities one because I can talk about utilities a lot. And I don't think anybody realizes or appreciates that because the town of Chapel Hill grew up along with the university, what happened was is that the university built all of the town's first utility systems. So the university built the sewer system and the water system and the electrical system and the phone system. Right. And I first started hearing this when I would hear stories from alumni who would talk about, or even people who lived in Chapel Hill, how if you wanted to pay your phone bill, you had to go to the bursar's office at the university to pay your phone bill. And that indeed they had done that. And that in the 1980s then, the university sold all those utilities off to the municipalities as it should have been all along. Very interesting. For me, um, one of the things that surprised me was how much, so we looked at the origin of lots of campus traditions and it surprised me how much went back to this, the 1890s and was and coincided with the rise of college sports. So, you know, UNC was open for a century um, sports were not a big deal, but it really began in the 1880s and especially the 1890s, primarily with football. Um, but the, um, the Tar Heel nickname applied to the university comes from that time. The school colors, uh, Carolina blue and white from the dialectic and philanthropic societies come from that time. Um, the alma mater was written then. The Daily Tar Heel started in 1893. Um, the Ram mascot um, was just a few years later. So, so much of what we associate as the traditions of, of Carolina today don't go back to the beginning, but they're really closely tied to the, the rise of sports on campus. Um, I, I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, that is very fascinating. So we'll stick with the sports theme for a while. Uh, Jenny asked, which is a fun question. I'm sure you've heard the news by now. Um, mm -hmm. It's been trending that uh, Michael Jordan's last dance uh, had aired on ESPN uh, Sunday. And so Jenny asked, did you provide any of the content or footage uh, for this new series? They work, the, the producers from ESPN have been working um, with Wilson Library for at, at least the past year. Um, you know, they were using the Dean Smith papers there. They were looking at old um, college publications and yearbooks. So yeah, a lot of the, what you'll see from um, Jordan's era at Carolina, um, the, the images, you know, come from from Wilson Library, and I know that they used a, a good number of Hugh Morton photos too. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for that. And I would encourage anyone who's watching now, feel free to continue to ask questions. Um, I'll ask a few other questions. You mentioned uh, the origin of Tar Heel. Maybe touch on that for a lot of us, some members of our audience who may not know uh, where that originated from. Um, you want me to do that, Nick? Yeah, you got it. Okay. So the origin of the term Tar Heel is actually goes back to, it's the name for what North Carolinians call themselves, right? The Tar Heel State. Mm -hmm. 
And that comes from the colonial era origins of, of the state and the industry in what was known at the time as naval stores. So the vast forest of pine trees, of longleaf pine and pine trees through this area provided for much of the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century, um, all of the tar and rosin and, and wood for sailing ships, for England sailing ships. And um, there's a whole industry, there was a whole industry around um, tapping the trees to make tar and to make rosin. And the people who worked in that, who were for the most part enslaved people, came to be called tar heels because they had tar on their heels and, and it was a messy kind of thing. So in, in some ways it sort of evolved not unlike other terms in that it started out as sort of a derogatory term, but then came to be adopted as a term of pride mm -hmm. and identifying with North Carolina. So it, we don't have a, a specific moment when somehow the UNC sports teams decided they would be called Tar Heels, though we looked a whole lot, but it just seemed to become natural that the state university should, the team should be called Tar Heels. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, makes sense. And thank you, Ray, for that question. I actually, we had the same question, we we're thinking alike. Um, so I mentioned at the top that this gave me the great opportunity to merge uh, two great passions in the library and UNC. And sort of as you were going through this through this work, and obviously libraries were invaluable to you and have been invaluable to you. Just curious, um, it, you know, it, a lot of the things that come out in this book are things that people think about, and but they may not appreciate that the reason we're able to go back and look at all this and be able to share this with the next generation is really the libraries. And I was struck by recently a colleague who was speaking to me about learning from um, the Spanish flu uh, back in 1918 and what it may have the relevance for today with COVID-19. And they went to the library to do this, right? And fortunately we have uh, letters from um, some of the citizens at the time and really trying to piece back some of these things that happened in our past that are so relevant today. And so I think it would be great if you could talk about just your, just the impact of libraries just on this work and just, on your life and just sort of everyone has a library story um, and just what is your library story and just sort of how has libraries contributed to your careers in this work? You can go first again. Oh, I can? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, well, I certainly, I was one of those children that grew up going to libraries from as early as I can remember. My parents always took us to the library until we could ride our bikes ourselves and then we went to the library and, and, and everything. And certainly um, by the time I became a historian, and as I was learning to be a historian, you, you develop a great deal of understanding and respect for the librarians and the archivists who are, are it's not just a matter of saving everything. It's, it's intentionally making sure you're collecting certain kinds of things and, and then making those things accessible. Mm -hmm and helping people understand certain stories like the Spanish flu mm -hmm. from the records they have. And, and watching, um, certainly as I was finishing my doctorate was about the time really the digitization was taking off. So watching more and more things become available, much more accessible to all different kinds of people it has just been to me extremely exciting to be able to read old newspapers and look at old pictures just makes it alive for people. Right. Right. Yeah, for me, it was I, um, you know, I, I worked in libraries in college and then, you know, decided to, to go into it as a, as a career. And, you know, to follow up on what Cecilia was saying, my career has kind of coincided with the rise of, of digital libraries. And that's important for, for everyone, but especially important for special collections. So you know, li libraries like Wilson Library at UNC is filled with material, um, a large part of which is unique. It's not available anywhere else in the world. And the only way for the first you know, decades that it was open that people could, could see it was to come to campus. Um, it's open to everyone and you, could, you can still do that. Um, not, not at the moment, but you know, when we reopen. At some point. At some point. <laughs> um, but you know, the idea of primary source research as being this kind of you know, specialized thing that was only available to historians was was completely turned on its head when we made these things 
these materials, manuscripts, archives, newspapers, old letters and diaries, you know, some of our rarest books, we made them freely available online. Um, it enables everyone to do the kinds of things I was talking about when I was talking about the Hinton James story um, or talk about the Tar Heel um, origins. You know, you can, you can challenge the stories. You can ask those questions. Um, you know, okay, that's, that's the history. How do we know that? How do we know what we know? Um, and so it's so important for, um, you know, critical reading and for understanding and interpreting history. And it's not the, the you know, Wilson Library at UNC is one of the largest, most prominent special collections libraries in the country, um, renowned for collections on the American South. But these kinds of, you know, collections are scattered throughout North Carolina. Um, there are a, a handful of, you know, great ones in Charlotte um, at the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, UNC Charlotte, Johnson C. Smith has great special collections. So, you know, these, you know, unique collections, um, you know, primarily a lot of them have community and local history um, are, are all across our state. So it's, um, I think it's important to, you know, you can use the Library of Congress online, but you can also discover what's in your community and, you know, dig into this, this history yourself. Um, and it's, it's fun to do. And I hope that, you know, our work inspires people to, to do some more of that on their own. Got it. Got it. So interesting question from Caitlin came in and I know I'm jumping around, but I want to stay on this theme of libraries uh, for a little bit is so a lot isn't yet digital. Uh, if you could visit any library or museum or collection, what would it be? Wow. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I guess for me, <laughs> um, it would be probably the British Library, yeah. which I have not ever been to, but would love to go to. Uh, that's because in addition to my interest in UNC, I also have an interest in theater history. Mm -hmm. So certainly the history of drama and theater would be one. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, hadn't, I wasn't quite prepared for that one. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> I don't know put the British Library on on my list too. Um, you know, and I you know I think some of the the great national libraries, um, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, um, some of the libraries in the Netherlands, um, and you know that and there's great libraries in you know Central and South America. So I you know I, I think these kind of the idea of these national libraries I think are they're so enormous and so ambitious. Um, you know, I'd love to see more of them. Makes sense. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to go back up in the feed a little bit. And interesting question from Karen. Uh, is there a myth or some sort of misconception about UNC that you would like to correct for us? Oh. Um, hmm. One that, um, that I wrote about recently, and this is, again, um, you know I, know, I know their intentions are good, but one of the ones that the campus tour guides love to talk about is the myth of the dunce cap. Have you heard that one? That if you stand at South Building and you look at Wilson Library, you can see the, the tip of the bell tower um, rising over the dome of the library, looking like a dunce cap. And, uh, you know, the legends emerged that this was an intentional thing, to, you know, that that came out of a, a feud. I've heard some tour guides call it a family feud. Um, it was it was very much accidental, um, you know, despite the, it, it, the, the real story is much more boring. Um, right. It's about, you know, locating you know, buildings on campus. Um, that's one that we hear a lot these days that um, we have to bust the myth. I'm also dubious about Hinton James walking. Um, yeah. but, you know, there's no evidence to support either that's side. Really <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Makes sense. So yeah, I want to give you the chance to answer that question, but if you, we can, we can move on to the next question. Oh, let's move on to the next question. Okay. All right, sounds good. So this is interesting. So what, it, maybe you haven't thought this far, but you know we're going to go ahead and, and move you there. Uh, what is your next project? Oh wow! Well, um, my next project—I have two actually. One is um, more uh, 19th century UNC history based, especially the era of Reconstruction mm -hmm. in Chapel Hill and in UNC. That's a period of time when the university closed for right. five years. Um, and, and there is, the more we did research around um, not only William Saunders and the Confederate Monument and this book, the more it became really obvious that nobody had, has, has ever really written about what Chapel Hill was like, what the area was like, what happened, 
And so that's a, that's a real kind of big topic, but there are pieces of it I, I want to learn more about and write about. Sounds good. So that's mine. I'd love to do a, um, a new pictorial history of the university. Um, so this book is chock full of facts um, and a handful of images, but I think, I think it's time for a new coffee table book. Um, yeah. Looking at historic images and recent ones, I think that'd be a lot of fun, and you know, I know, I think a lot of alums would enjoy that. Too. I think we would. I'd, I'd pre-order that, so uh, <laughs> we'll look out for that. So keep it, keep us posted. Uh, one last question, sort of, I'll ask. So you know, it's it's impossible to have uh, two great historians, uh, archivists here uh, without asking: Is there anything from a UNC perspective, an educational perspective, just a societal uh, perspective that we can learn? Um, from the history that that you've researched and doing this book, uh, what can we take away for the future based on that? If there's any nugget that you can offer, well, I'll start. I'll start with that a little bit because, as, as it should be obvious, much of what I spent my last five to seven years on were um, the difficult, problematic. I don't want to say problematic, but the difficult topics around. Um, University of North Carolina and its legacies of, with slavery and with the Civil War, which is in, much in line with what a lot of American universities are dealing with right now. And um, the thing that I wish that we could take away and what to me was so, was so exciting about UNC history is that it really spans the entire history of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it began at the same time as the United States did. And there are so many aspects about university history that help us understand American history and understand why we're where we are. And, and to me, that's a very exciting way to help think about the future, mm -hmm. is that if you understand all that better, you can then build from that. And so to me, UNC history just is so, is not only local history and higher education history, it's US history. That's great. That, yeah, that's I would you know reiterate that absolutely. Um, it's it's history in a microcosm for everything. For for me, um, you know what surprised me over and over again was UNC's centrality as as a state university with it with a true commitment to service to the state of North Carolina. And that that didn't start in 1793, but it's you know at least since the beginning of the 20th century, on to the present. Um, you know UNC has been dedicated to you know being of service to the entire state. And that, that extends to the whole university system now. But I think that we're seeing that, um, you know, right now with the, the research that's being done on campus, School of Public Health and Department of Medicine, um, trying to help deal with the, the current pandemic. Um, I think that, you know, just showing how important it is for a state to have a great public university that is, you know, dedicated to public service, um, you know, that's shown up time and time again in the university's history. And I think we're seeing that um, right now. Um, so that was, you know, a little surprising, but mostly gratifying to see and, you know, you know, gave us, you know, a renewed sense of commitment. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that too. That's great. Re excellent takeaways. And uh, again, I want to thank you both. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, on behalf of the uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library Foundation, and all our viewers this evening. Uh, thank you for actually dealing with this new medium as we deal with our new normal and thank being with you. virtually. I hope to be able to shake your hand at some point in the future yeah. if you're still shaking hands uh, in the future. Um, but thank you again, and thank the UNC Press for really working with the Library Foundation uh, for tonight's final draft. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, again, that you can purchase uh, this new book, um, it's great for yourself or for the Tar Heel in your, in your family or in your life uh, through Park Road Books and Main Street Books. And you can also support uh, local businesses uh, during this time of, of great stress. Um, also, I'd like to highlight that this week is National Library Week. So coincidentally, we're here talking about the libraries and it's National Library Week. And I want you to know that the library continues to provide access to information, education and entertainment for all ages even during this time while we're staying at home. You know, I think during this time and probably after this time, libraries will be more relevant, more important than ever. And again, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, uh, but there is far few institutions in our society that provide the value for free and to all that the library does. And we continue to do that even through these times of adapting to a new normal. And so we hope that Everyone is continuing to use the library, continuing to support the library. Uh, we understand that times are, are financially tough for all, 
Uh, but if you can find it, if you're fortunate enough, we continue to ask that you support the uh, Library Foundation financially as well. Uh, so we continue to provide that great enrichment to kids through story times, um, through resources for those who need it, and for everyone trying to seek and empower themselves through knowledge. So thank you again for everyone joining tonight. And I just want to leave it before one last plug. Uh, we have one more event this week, uh, Library Week, so big week. Thursday night, we have a final draft home edition, Karen Slaughter, New York Times bestseller, suspense author. And if you attended Verse and Vino this past year, she was a Verse and Vino favorite. She will be our guest author. And so that promises to be a great event. So thanks again for joining tonight. Uh, stay, stay well, stay safe, and stay sane. Take care. Bye.